in 1953, the United States, together with Britain, participated in a coup in Iran that got rid of Mossadegh. Mossadegh and his government were swept from power in favor of General Zahidi. 300 killed and hundreds wounded is a conservative estimate. The British government has never officially acknowledged its role in the coup. I don't think at any time we really planned a coup d'etat. These words have not been heard or seen for over 34 years. Evidence that has the potential to turn a dark chapter in history inside out. Your British counterpart was in fact blank. Could you tell me something about the man blank? Norman Derbyshire, take one. He was somebody who felt that there were things to be said that hadn't been said. A member of the British government was involved in the assassination of the chief of police. How did it come to this? So they tied him up, strangled him and shot him. Were you involved in Afshar II's assassination? Yes. My father is a real prime minister. <laughs> the in Iran is shaping politics to this day. The United States does not want democracy in the Middle East. The actual running of the coup from our side was my responsibility. It's the sort of thing you won't find in any book. Okay, we're live. All right. Um, welcome to this very, very special Q&A for Q53. It's around 3 p.m. in Los Angeles, 6 p.m. roughly in uh, New York, and 11 p.m. Uh, in London, where we are. And But we are connected through space and time for a very special conversation between two giants of cinema. Uh, the gods of cinema are smiling on this event. The gods of cinema have been smiling on Q53 ever since they gave me Walter Merch to cut it. And uh, the two gentlemen here with me, and uh, trust me, I'm not going to be here for long. I'm just introducing and getting out. This is not a place for me but I'm just doing the introduction. Uh, the two gentlemen here are responsible for some of the greatest movies of all time. The films these gentlemen have made have entered our collective consciousness. They've come to define 20th century cinema. And I am astronomically, astronomically honored and, and delighted and privileged to be here to introduce them. Um, Walter Merch and Paul Hirsch. Paul Hirsch, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for introducing Walter Merch to the rest of the audience and doing the questions and answers with him. Uh, I'm going to read, uh, uh, because I don't want to, uh, Paul very graciously sent me his bio and said, feel free to cut it. Are you kidding? Am I going to edit what he writes? I'm not. I'm going to read it. Uh, and uh, I will then do an intro to Walter, give you a few housekeeping points, and we'll clear the stage for them to do their thing. This is an amazing, amazing, unique event. You know, these two artists having a fireside chat about a little documentary we made over four years. <clears throat> uh, Paul Hirsch. Ace, A-C-E, isn't that cool having Ace after your name? Paul Hirsch Ace has edited over 40 films, among them the first Star Wars, otherwise known as A New Hope, written and directed by George Lucas, for which he received an Academy Award in 1978, and The Empire Strikes Back. He's edited 11 films for Brian Palmer, including Carrie, Blowout, Phantom of the Paradise, and Mission Impossible. Four films for Herbert Ross, including Footloose, The Secret of My Success, and Steel Magnolias. Three for John Huston, including Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and one of my favorites, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and four- John Nine. Hughes. I'm sorry? John Hughes, not John Huston. Did I say John Huston? Oh, I told you I'm nervous I was going to screw this up. I've already done it. Sorry, <laughs> I do apologize. John Hughes, not John Huston. And, uh, and, and Falling Down for Joel Schumacher. In 2005, he received his second Academy Award nomination, an Ace Eddie Award for Ray, based on the life of Ray Charles, uh, directed by Taylor Hackford. The various genres, and he's covered the genres of drama, action, horror, musical comedy, fantasy, suspense, mystery, and comedy, one of the most difficult things to pull off in a movie. In 2011, he edited Source Code, 
uh, directed by Duncan Jones before seguing into Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol directed by Brad Bird. Warcraft, his second picture with director Duncan Jones was released in 2016. He was born in New York City in 1945. His father, Joseph Hirsch, was a well-known painter whose works are in the permanent collections of major museums all over the US, including the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Whitney Museum. His mother and stepfather, Ruth and Leonard Bocour, I hope I've said that, I've said that right, yes. were important collectors of 20th century American painting. He spent part of his childhood growing up in Paris and is fluent in French, somewhat conversant in Italian, and British. He speaks British. It's amazing. <laughs> he's, better, he's British probably better than my British. He studied music at the High School of Music and Art in New York City, where he played the timpani and developed a musical sensibility which has served him well in his chosen profession. We can talk about the rhythm of music and rhythm of editing. I mean, that's, I'll leave that to, him, to them if they want to. He majored in art history at Columbia University, which, he st which started him out on a life of sitting in a dark room, critiquing images projected on a screen. He is married with two grown up offsprings, both in the film business, and has lived for the last 35 years in Pacific Palisades. He is the author of, of, of a new book, relatively new book, uh, and, and I love the title of this book. I absolutely love the title of this book. A long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. There it is. And I love that picture. For those who've grown up in digital age, that's a moviola. That's how movies were made on celluloid in front of machines like that. So there you go. That's that's Paul Hirsch. Thank you for joining us, um, Walter Merch. My pleasure, uh, Walter Merch. His 50-year career in cinema stretches back to 1969. Francis Ford Coppola's *The Rain People*, and includes works uh, work on the THX 1138, *The Godfather* one, two, and three, *American Graffiti*, *The Conversation*, *Apocalypse Now*, *The English Patient*, *The Talented Mr. Ripley*, *Cold Mountain* and many other films with directors such as George Lucas, Fred Zinnemann, Philip Kaufman, Anthony Minghella, Catherine Bigelow, Sam Mendes, and Brad Bird. Murch's pioneering achievement in sound were acknowledged by Coppola in his 1979 Palm Door winner, Apocalypse Now, for which Murch was granted in film history first, film history first, the screen credit for sound designer. Murch has been nominated for nine Academy Awards, six for editing and three for sound, and has won three Oscars for Best Sound on Apocalypse Now, for which he is and his collaborators devised the now standard 5.1 sound format. If you go to a movie and hear sounds all around you, everywhere, that's Walter Merch and his collaborators. And for Best Editing and Best Sound for his work on The English Patient, that's an unprecedented double Oscar on the same film, although his double win in 1997 was un also unprecedented in the history uh, of BAFTAs because he won BAF uh, two BAFTAs for sound and picture editing on the conversation in 1974. The English Patient was coincidentally the first digitally edited film to win editing Oscar. And I think Walter has edited film on just about every machine that cinema invented for editing, uh, right through from the Moviola, Ken, Steenbeck, and Final Cut to now. Uh, I'm gonna add a personal note to Walter's introduction. Walter has been an amazing, amazing rock, the heart and soul of Crew 53. He has, he has honored me with his company and his creative energy and his commitment to Crew 53 for four years. Uh, Crew 53, uh, and I will get off, I promise I will get off. Uh, and Crew 53 has been a labor of love. Uh, uh, the gods of cinema smiled on it 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when they said, we're not going to give you a studio, we will not give you a distributor, sales agent, or any money, but we will give you Walter Merch. And he's been a gift from the gods of cinema. Walter Merch is the gift of gods from cinema and he's brought us the gift of uh, Paul Hirsch. So um, housekeeping, if you want to ask questions, email them uh, to hello at coo53.com. Uh, I'm going to get out of here and leave the stage for this fine gentleman to uh, tell you about movies like you've never heard before. Well, that's Thank a you, hard, intro hard yeah. introduction to live <laughs> up to. Um, how are you, Walter? Good. Good. It's uh, I wanna... almost. It's coming up to midnight here, but I'm a night. I'm a night person, so this doesn't bother me. Thank goodness. Um, I want to congratulate you both on turning out a, a fantastic film, uh, an important film because it's um, something that you know is so important in American history, and yet American. I would venture to say that most Americans don't know anything about the events of that time. Yeah. So uh, I think you've both done a tremendous service in that sense. 
um, I was thinking about history and how in America, when, when you say, uh, well, that's history, it means that's something to be forgotten. <laughs> well, that that's history. Just forget it. Yeah. You know, where yeah. in other parts of the world, when people say it's history, you know, that's, that's an important, you can yeah. look it up, you know, it's, yeah. but anyway, you've done a good, a great service to uh, history in, in the best sense. Um, when I heard you say that you had been working with 532 hours of footage, the first thing that I thought of was that the only comparable task that that I could think of uh, was the um, Iranian students piecing together <laughs> the shredded yeah. documents from the American embassy in 1979. I think, yeah. I think Coup 53 is sort of the equivalent of that. Um, yeah, but, there's, there's even a, a kind of an equivalent scene in the film where Tagi comes across a document that has been shredded by the filmmakers. You know, they've, they've cut out the good bits to put them in a script and he's, got, yeah. he's left with the, the rejected bits, but he finds yeah. another uh, transcript of that interview and slides them together so it's sort of the reverse of what the Iranian students were doing. So um, st stepping away from Coup 53 for a moment, I wanted to ask you, in your life, you've edited mostly features. And uh, in the last uh, decade or so, you, you've done these uh, kind of massive documentaries. Can you talk about that? What, what led you to start doing this? Yeah, uh, well, there are features too. They're they're close to two hours long, each of them. So, but they're not fiction; they're fact. Um, right. And I've discovered uh, that I can't really predict what direction the, my life is going to go, what projects are going to arise or disarise, or when I get fired or not or hired. You know, it's a it's a slightly chaotic world that we live in, film editors. Uh, and both of these projects, the Coup 53 and Particle Fever, which is the, the search for the Higgs boson, which I edited back in 2012, 2013, were, were pitched as little short things, uh, you know, three or four months of work. And then things happen, you know, as the right. famous saying goes. And it's just part of my DNA that if I agree to be on a film, whatever the circumstances, however much salary I'm getting, I just I stick with it uh, because I can't un unattach myself. Once I commit, that's it. And um, uh, uh, Particle Fever, I was on it for 15 months. And Coup 53, in a sense, I'm still on it. Uh, because there's a big story that happens after the film gets released, but basically I was I was what you might call uh, at at the lathe grinding out the the uh, the gerbils with um, uh, for for about four years. Uh, wow! Minus a nine month period when we had to put down our scissors because we ran out of money, and then there was another period of about three or four months. So, uh, what are the what are some of the differences between cutting fiction and nonfiction? And yeah. uh, a corollary corollary to that is, aren't you freer in some sense as an editor doing nonfiction than you are doing yeah. fiction? Yeah, it's um, I, I'm going to get on a little soapbox now, which is that any editor film editor who works on an unscripted documentary, such as Particle Fever or Coup 53, or most documentaries now are unscripted. We just kind of go in to see what happens. They should get credit as a writer because that's what you're doing. You're writing, you're not you know, using your fountain pen, although I did, I did do that. But uh, we are working with the alphabet that is at our command, which are images and sounds in a timeline and, uh, you know, putting scene cards up on the wall and staring at them and wondering what the best order should be and writing narration occasionally. 
So it, yes, it, you have more freedom because you are an author of, of the piece. Uh, in my case, a co-author of Coup 53, along with Tagi. He was generous enough to grant me my soapbox wish and, and give that mm -hmm. credit. But I think it should apply to all uh, film editors who, are, who embark on this weird project of an unscripted, uh, unpredictable documentary. Um, as it turned out, uh, when I signed on to the project, there was a studio, a big Hollywood studio attached to it, who were going to fund maybe a, a third of the of the money. The rest was left up to Tagi to raise. Uh, but for mysterious reasons, they dropped out after three months, um, never giving a real reason why they did that. And so the project changed. The color of the project changed to we are not only writing the project and researching the project, but we are raising the money for the project, making you know, 20 minute versions of the film in order to show people in order to get money. So it was, uh, you know, it, it had, it, be, it suddenly became a multifaceted uh, organization. But uh, to your point uh, of, the, of the question, the, uh, certainly in the initial stages, when you are editing a scripted film, your role is to interpret that almost in a musical sense. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. here's the score and you have to play every note. If it's in the script, certainly bef before you get to a first assembly, you have to include everything because you just never know how it's going right. to turn out. Right. So you are interpreting in a sense, where am I going to put the pedal down in pianistic terms? Where am I going to go arpeggio? Where am I going to go legato? Uh, who am I going to be on for this line and react on this line? These are all interpretive choices, ultimately to be uh, modified and overridden by the director. But by and large, the editor is pretty much left. We are left on our own to put the first assembly together. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the case. I, I call uh, that I call that the building of the film as yeah. opposed to the editing of it. Yeah. That first you have to build it before you can edit it. Yeah, the, the, the French word is much more accurate, montage, which means exactly. to put together. A plumber right. will come to your house and montage the pipes. Uh, so there is that double aspect. There is the montage, putting it all together, and then the careful deconstruction of that figuring out what we can leave out. So the, the process of editing a documentary is very different because we are writing the documentary as we put it together. Uh, once you reach the sweet spot where at least you have an assembly, uh, the differences start to evaporate uh, because we're, we have a story of course, there are going to be modifications along the way, but we're trying to tell the story in the shortest amount of time, but no shorter, the most emotional way with the correct emotion uh, in the right amount of time. And that applies to whether you're doing a, a documentary or a feature film, as far as my experience goes. I just right. wanted to say one other thing, which yes. uh, many of the editors listening here know exactly what I'm talking about. You, of course, know exactly what I'm talking about, which is that an, to be an effective editor, you have to have an intuition, either through intuition or experience, about how you can navigate the jungle gym of the hierarchy of a film, because sometimes you're, you you're going to be called upon to do much more than just interpret it. You're going to be, in musical terms, you're going to be called upon to orchestrate the music. Uh, and you're maybe even called upon to recompose the, the music, so to speak, of the film. And this gets into delicate areas because there is a director above you and a producer or a studio above that. And to try to find the path to that. I, I love the introduction of your book where you talked about the freedom that comes from the powerlessness of the editor and right. to say almost anything uh, and to be able to, it has to be a good idea, you, but you can defend it 
uh, but you have a freedom because you are not because you are where you are in that hierarchy. Yeah, nobody's threatened by our our ideas. They're just offered as suggestions. Right. Um, you have talked about coming into this project after Tagi had been working on it for a while. Um, what did what were you presented with at that point? Forty hours. More or unedited. Less. There was no cut yeah, or anything. No, no editing. Uh, Forty hours of interviews, uh, interviews and archive material, and uh, I'll call them taggyisms because he's an inveterate uh, filmer of himself. Uh, apparently, this is a family lore that goes back to when he was, I don't know, twelve or so. Uh, but it's it's him musing on what he's doing, kind of a video diary. Uh, uh, of of making the film, and That's so that the, was the those were the elements that I looked at at the beginning. So you you watched forty hours of of unedited footage at the right. outset, right? So it really didn't start to this the cut didn't really begin until you were involved. Yeah, no, absolutely, and uh, um. The, the, that what you described as uh, Taki filming himself gives the film a kind of uh, meta aspect uh, because yeah. it's not only a film about Coup 53, it's a film about the making of the film about Coup 53. So there, yeah. there are these two uh, stories going on uh, at once. And I, yeah. I wanted to get into that a little. Do, do you think that... Um, that aspect of the film is essential to it? Uh, yes, although I should say that it was never Tagi's intention to be in the film. He was just filming these things because that's who he is. And I watched them because it helped me to understand who he is, because I'd be going to be working with him. And that changed uh, when I saw an interview that he did that summer with uh, Malcolm Byrne at the NSA, the National Security Archive, which is at George Washington University in DC. And he found himself unexpectedly in front of a file cabinet, this is what you see in the film, and Malcolm pulls out the drawer. Thankfully, it was the middle drawer so they could both look down at it. And in there, not the whole drawer, but maybe a third of it, was all of the CIA material relating to the coup in Iran in 1953. And that suddenly was a moment where Tagi unexpectedly was looking at this thing, realizing that is, that's the reason why I am where I am, why what happened to my family happened to my family, what happened to my friends, the whole history of Iran, uh, certainly in the second half of the 20th century is that. And there was something wonderful about the unexpectedness of it and the expression on his face, which is very authentic. It was not yeah. planned. And yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because I thought, uh, was this actually, because, you know, filming in, in the archive that way, uh, it seemed to me you wouldn't have gone to the trouble of doing that unless you knew that what you found there was a significant find. And I thought, well, once they discovered these uh documents, they recreated the moment when the documents were found to record it for for the film. But you're saying no. that's not the case. No, that's, uh, again, that's not how Tuggy works. He just, uh -huh. uh, he dives in to the pool with, that, with the, the, the largest idea of what he's doing, but not in any detail. He doesn't do uh, much more beyond the most elementary prep work. Malcolm Byrne, Director General of the the NSA has the documents, and he's willing to let me shoot there. And you know, he looked at the location and he saw the very interesting room uh, just down the hall from Malcolm's office, which is where there are all these file boxes full of all the, the stuff. Uh, you know, not just Iran, obviously, but. Uh, all of the MK Ultra stuff and uh, other coups that have been waged over the many years of the CIA. So he just what's knew MK, he, he had an MK intuition Ultra? that it, this is going to be a very rich experience, but he didn't know that this was going to happen. 
What's and then, MKUltra? But that applies to almost oh. all of what he does. What is MK Ultra? I don't know that. That's the mind control stuff where they they wanted oh. to figure out a way to erase everything from a person's brain through the use of LSD and other auto suggestions. This is right around 1953, actually. And then plant a whole new set of facts and personalities in the person's brain. Basically, it's the, uh, you know, it, 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 they never succeeded at it uh, because the mind is a much more complicated thing than they thought it was. But that was the attempt. I see. Um, so was there a reason that so much of the film is devoted to, I mean, let me go back a little. You talk about um, four threads that you worked with in constructing the film. Right. And you talked about um, expert historians, Iranian testimony, historical archive, and investigative Sherlock Holmes kind of material. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, as as, uh, as I saw with that 40 hours that I began with, that really just continued. And um, the, the interviews, one of the main things that Tagi wanted to do was to tell this story with Iranian voices, which had never been done before by a film that is going to be shown in the West. The people who were there at the time are all in their late 80s or mid up to mid 90s now. And, and they're falling off the perch, as, as my wife says. Uh, so he felt, I have to make this film quick before they all disappear. And so he wanted to include that. And um, so there's those and the, the people who know the history of it uh, are historical ex experts. So I, I began, you know, you have to begin somewhere to get a handle on these things. So I, I made a timeline of nothing but historical experts, and I found that I could have them toss the ball to each other just by nature of the way they kind of pose their answers. It raises another question, and then one of the other experts answers that question. So, you know, it was a kind of a ping pong match with occasional interjections of, of text, which were questions that Tagi asked. And so that was five hours long, four and a half hours long. And I did the same thing with the Iranian voices. Uh, and then I did the same thing with the archive material, simply uh, arranging all of our archive material in chronological order, and then trying to find out wh where are the clumps here, the, the, the moments that could ultimately congeal into a scene. And that was, so each of these was was four and a half hours long, which uh, whatever the math is, 18 hours of timelines. And then uh, we, Tagi and I looked at that and kind of got into the zone of it, you know, over a couple of days and then thought, well, let's uh, begin by seeing if we can weave these together. This is a Persian story. So, and these are threads. So it's kind of like a Persian carpet. And so you didn't that, attempt you didn't attempt to polish each thread. No, no, no. Uh, well, it, you know, it depends on what your definition of polish is. Tagi says these are perfectly polished things, but you know, it, it, there, it's all, you know, up to whatever standard uh, that you're operating on. They were viewable. They, they were, you know, they were kind of interesting to look at, but obviously at that length, not viable. And so right. the thing that makes it viable is this interweaving of the threads that gives, and it's the, the collision of the different threads that produces the color of ultimately of, of the film. At this point, we had not yet discovered this, what I called the, the, the X factor. One of our story cards on the wall, uh, you may even see it in some of the scenes of the film is a ominous looking black card with an X on it, which is to say the mystery we're going to find something that nobody's really found before. And that began to emerge uh, after a, a year and a half or so of working on the film in the character of that Ray Fiennes plays in, in the film, the character of Norman Derbyshire, who was an MI6 agent. 
So that, that was an element that uh, began to wrap itself into the story at, at a subsequent point. What went into deciding to make it a film and not a multi-part series? We we had we had an assembly that was uh, that that Derbyshire was in in a very schematic way, not not yet Ray Fines, but you know uh, another actor reading the lines, and that was eight and a half hours long in June of 2018, and that was a branch point where we thought, okay, this could be a six-part series, um, and. We tossed that around for a while and then realized we don't have the time, money, or energy to, to do that. And there is nobody, there's no studio behind this. And to make a six-part series without a studio backing is, is a little bit too risky and, and, and time-consuming. So we, we decided uh, to condense it down to ultimately under two hours. And the thing that helped us do that as I mentioned just earlier, was the emergence of the spine of the film, which is this test, te testimony by Norman Derbyshire, the, the character played by Ray Fiennes. It's been said that on feature films, the director is God, but on documentaries, God is the director. Yeah, is, Alfred Hitchcock. Is that what, as a Hitch? No. Um, That's it. Yeah. So was Derbyshire, I mean, was God the director bringing Derbyshire into it? Was this sort of an an accident uh, in the course of making the film? This this avenue suddenly presented itself and and yeah. and re revealed itself to be something much yeah. more important than you expected it to be. Absolutely. I mean, it wasn't totally suddenly. We the first hint of him began to emerge in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after I got on the film, but it was very low. You know, it was one of these things kind of right down on the bottom uh, of what we were thinking about. And um, it, it started to really emerge when we found out that the, the uh, Granada television in England, which is I, basically has become ITV, the commercial channel of England, uh, Great Britain, uh, made a series called End of Empire in 1985. And one of the series was a 52 minute on the coup, basically on, on the history of Britain's relationship with Iran. They, Iran was never part of the empire, but it was the, the commercial interests were so uh, convoluted that it, it effectively was part of the empire, although not legally. And so this episode came. Um, this episode came uh, to our attention that the makers of that series had given all of the outtakes and I'll call them the intakes. Everything that they shot was on in public access at the British Film Institute (BFI), and apparently. Nobody had looked at it in the 35 years since they put it there. So we decided to go look at it. And we thought, we have this transcript, but Derbyshire himself was not in that episode. Maybe he'll be in the outtakes, but he wasn't. And so that's where the hunt began to find out, where is it? Let's find it. And... Uh, and that's where we met up with multiple points of view about, does it exist? Was there film? No, there wasn't. Yes, there was. Um, and that's what we present in the first uh, 20 minutes or so of the film. And at a certain point, we kind of run out of rope. We, we can't find it. And we have to get on with telling the story of the coup. And that's where we have Rafe Fines come and sit down uh, and become the Norman Derbyshire character and read these uh, lines of the transcript as if he, you know, he's channeling these words of, of Norman Derbyshire. Interestingly, right. in the same room in which all of the other, or many of the other uh, End of Empire interviews were held in the yeah, Savoy I wanted, Hotel. I wanted, 
I wanted to ask you about that because at one point um, you have a uh, an interview with a CIA agent named Mead, right. and you cut to Fines. Uh, it looks like a reaction shot to what Mead is saying. You you right. Uh, can you talk about that a little? Yeah, they. Uh, this is a. He's a fascinating character, almost as fascinating as Norman Derbyshire. This is Stephen Mead, uh, who died in the early years of this century, but he was a, a CIA agent, and uh, Mead and Derbyshire were a double act. They were kind of, you know, Laurel and Hardy. I don't mean to characterize them quite that way, but they were on a first name basis with each other. And they had a kind of good cop, bad cop, tag team uh, relationship, specifically to get the sister of the Shah named Ashraf Pahlavi, uh, who was in exile in France, to go to Iran, which was very risky for her. They were going to pay her to do this. And she was uh, resistant to this idea. But they managed to convince her to do this because of their uh, expertise in uh, secret ops. They knew how to do these things. And so she finally agreed and was paid and went to Iran and delivered a message to the Shah that says the British government and the American government are committed and will back you up if you go along with this idea of a coup to get rid of this man who was a thorn in your side, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, who was the prime minister of Iran, who, who was the causus belli of, of this whole operation. He had nationalized the oil of Iran in 1951. And this was a big no-no, not only for Great Britain, who had huge, huge uh, vested interests in getting oil out of Iran at the lowest possible cost to them, uh, but also to the petroleum industry in general. Uh, they're the only countries that had nationalized oil prior to Mossadegh were the Soviet Union in 1917 and Mexico in 1938. So three times the charm. They didn't want this to become a habit. And if, if Mossadegh's uh, venture had succeeded, then they felt the whole, the whole thing was going to collapse. So lots of people were interested in deposing uh, Mossadegh. Anyway, the, these two guys were a tag team yeah, but and there was an interview was... with Mead that exactly corresponded to an interview with Derbyshire where they talked about what they did with Ashraf. So were they in together in the room together? I mean were at the same time cuz no. By no. by cutting by cutting to Rafe in the middle of Mead's interview, you imply that he's sitting there listening. Mead was photographed in the Pentagon, we believe. What I'm saying is that the device you used made it seem as if it were a reaction yeah. shot to what he was saying. Yeah, no, that it's was just our a intention. Cheat. It's just a cheat, is that it? Uh, yeah, you know, it, but that's, okay. that's, I think that's how, uh, if, if the dice had fallen in a slightly different way, that's what End of Empire would have done. They, they, in that cut up transcript, lots of the material that's cut up that they wanted to include in the film somehow was about this relationship between Stephen Mead, CIA, uh, and Norman Derbyshire. While we're on that subject, here's a clip from the film. It's an outtake, uh, but it examines that uh, curious relationship between the Stephen Mead interview and the uh, missing Norman Derbyshire interview. The great thing about analog, which is what we're looking at here, is that there is a record of what has been used and what has not been used. And when we work digitally, there is no trace of where we might have cut something. In the old days, a piece of film, you actually had to cut that piece out and use it. And if you later decided not to use it, you then put it back in the master role from which it came. But there is a trace, fingerprints, that say this shot was in the film at one time. There you can see the tape, that, that line across the bottom of the frame is a piece of scotch tape. 
So what I've done here is identified the clips that were used in End of Empire at one point. This clip was used, this clip was used, this clip was used, this and this. And here is Allison, 35 years ago, yeah. asking Stephen Mead about Norman Derbyshire. What kind of a man was Norman Derbyshire? Cut. Norman Derbyshire was a uh, very competent individual. Uh, he was, uh, had a lot of experience. He spoke Farsi fluently, French, and what other languages I don't know. But he was a very capable operator. And cut. The rules of the game are that if somebody talks about somebody, you have to have reference to that person. So we have this very long transcript of an interview with Norman Derbyshire, which has been cut up. And here we have a roll of work print of Stephen Mead talking about Derbyshire, which has been similarly cut up. So that begs the question, what happened to Norman Derbyshire? Okay, without getting too much into the history of Iran, I want to talk about the filmmaking a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we may. There were um, a number of stills that seemed to be have, to have been made into 3D images. What was that about? That's uh, a technique called 2.5D because it's, uh, you know, it, it's we take a still and cut it up uh, into three or four planes and then move those planes against each other in order to create this kind of um, Easter egg quality 3D. It's, it's not round 3D, but it gives right. you a, a better sense of being there. It was, you know, it, we, we would have wanted to do more of it, but uh, it costs a certain amount of money to do and, and time. It seemed to me you, you had pulled out all the stops of storytelling devices in the film. You have archive footage, you have reenactments, you have these little inserts of USB cables going into ports and right. mouse clicks on files and drone footage. And uh, it seems like there's, there's no, you know, the, the little close ups, you have these quick montages when you're looking at something on the computer is sort of cut, cut, cut of the. USB right. port and so forth uh, yeah. are kind of um, the kind of film technique you'd see in maybe in commercials or Madison Avenue, sort of uh, very tight close up in montage. Right. Uh, so it seems like you exploited every, what I was saying, um, when, I, when I think about the film, I mean, it, it really is a study in almost every storytelling technique there is. Uh, there's nothing, there's nothing you didn't resort to, yeah. uh, including uh, animation. Uh, could you yeah. talk a little bit about the animation yeah. um, and uh, how well, it was? Well, yeah. Well, I, I wanted I mean, to... go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. A, a vivid example of uh, the the opposite problem is the coup that happened on January sixth at the at the Capitol. Every single person, it seemed, had an, a smartphone and was photographing it. And so it's like Mabu, the thousand eyes of Dr. Mabu's. You know, <laughs> there was, everybody was photographing it from every conceivable angle. And, you know, that was part of the, uh, the, sh the, the show that the Democrats put on to try to get Donald Trump impeached was a montage of all of these different aspects of this attempted coup. Right. In 1953, in Iran, forget it. <laughs> you know, there were not even any portable cameras in them. Maybe somebody had an IMO somewhere, you know, the little combat camera. But uh, the coup happened mostly at night. Uh, and there just wasn't the sort of media coverage 67 years ago that there is right. today. And right. so that was our problem. And what we found, whenever we had a problem, we would sort of scratch our heads and say, what, how can we solve this and maybe break some new ground? And 
that the problem was that we had the testimony of many people on both sides of the coup uh, about what happened that day, the August 19th. But, no uh, images. but we had no footage of it. Right. So Tagi, it was Tagi's brother who had seen some animation done by a woman in this painterly style. And we looked at some of it and thought, that's the answer. She was not available, but we found uh, Martin Pick, a great animator who does that and does it digitally and does it very quickly. And so it's basically a rotoscoping. Uh, of I was going to ask about that. Was there original shooting to be serve as the yeah. basis for the animation? Yeah, we would. Uh, it was a mixture of archive of from other riots uh, done with a twist. Um, and then uh, things staged with actors, people in, in military costumes, you right. know, doing shooting and uh, things like that. And that, it, had that that rotos it had that rotoscope look, and yeah. I was wondering what well, the... It, it is rotoscoping. The, we would take, the, I was yeah, wondering I would, what the source material was. Yeah, it was, uh, I'm going to guess, 20% archive and 80% stuff that we shot over a day or two of, sh of shooting. And then I cut that together and gave it to Martin and he rotoscoped it. And then he gave that back to me. And then I continued to uh, refine it. Now that I saw it animated, I thought, well, this is, I could do this with that. And uh, so that's, that's the source of it. But it, it basically is an attempt to get out of the uncanny valley because if you restage something with people who really look like they are who they are, then, it, you know, is this, did it, what is this? Did this really happen? Um, and so the painterly aspect of it, this sort of impressionistic quality, visually represented in a kind of metaphoric way, what's happening in the brain of the person who is narrating this. And one of the main narrators of this section of the film is uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh's uh, main bodyguard, Musa Miran, uh, who was shooting back at the, basically the crowd, uh, the disaffected army financed by the UK and the USA who were shooting at him. And you know, many people died um, on, on Mossadegh's side. Um, I have to tell you, I saw that, as you know, I saw the picture uh, maybe a year and a half ago, something like that. And then I saw it again just recently. And I have to tell you, it has a very different effect uh, on the audience, on this audience, at least after January 6th. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's very disconcerting to watch um, this coup and see how similar it is to those images yeah. you talked about and to realize how uh, close we came to a very uh, dangerous precipice. Yeah. And I wanted to know if there's going to be a, a coup 21 movie uh, <laughs> about uh, right. the events of one six. Um, well, somebody will make it. It won't be us, but somebody uh, will make it. Yeah. Um, there are some things in there that I wanted to compliment you on. I, there was a uh, wonderful cut you made from somebody said, I think it was Meade or one of the other CIA guys. It might have been a, a MI6 guys, one of these spies said something about dirty tricks. And you cut oh, yeah. immediately to you cut immediately to Nixon, Nixon and Ike. Right. <laughs> I, yeah. I really yeah. loved that transition. And there was there was another lovely transition you made where Tagi gets up out of his chair and the, the chair spins and you cut to some mechanical device spinning. And I thought Right. Really nice uh, visual yeah. segue. Thank you. Um, Thanks. <laughs> yes. Kudos. Um, let me see. What else did I? Oh, there's some music under the newsreel that was so over the top dramatic. And I wondered if that was the original newsreel yeah. music. Yeah, yeah it's it was. great. It was. Uh, that's, that, that's how they swang back then. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was really great. And then, there was this quick montage of cartons of CIA files at the end. Right. Um, that was obviously uh, shot 
I mean, it was designed. How? how at what point in the in the shooting uh, in the making of the film was that conceived? I mean, early on well, or fairly, fairly late. Uh, fairly yeah, late. I would think. That, right. That we, we took our cue from that room that uh, that. Uh, Malcolm Byrne leaves Tagi alone in a room that is a library full of all the CIA secrets. Right, amazing. An, an amazing thing in itself. You know, here's an Iranian yeah. and he's sitting in Washington, D.C. in the library of the CIA secrets. And it just shows how trustworthy Tagi is with people like Malcolm Byrne, who was also a student of Iranian history. So uh, just the visual aspect of that room full of secrets made us think of this idea of putting these file boxes kind of in uh, as each of the coups is, is finished, starting with the 53 coup, but going on. Uh, you know, we, we did a Q&A a couple of days ago with a, a group of politicians in Washington, D.C., the Committee for the Republic, uh, who have uh, connections with the CIA uh, informationally, and they said the number is 64. There have been 64 coups by the CIA of the United States against other countries. So I wanted to that, slow the sequence small, down. A small section, but we shot, to... we shot that in London. Those, those boxes are shot in London. I wanted to slow it down so I could read each one because I saw they started to. I was I was watching and I was reading them and I thought yes yeah. yes I remember that and then, and then it starts right. going so fast I couldn't right. keep up with it and I wanted to to freeze yeah. on it and, and read each one but uh, yeah it's a um, we'll we'll do a slow motion version of it and post it on the website. <laughs> um, I remember my. Uh, this all, you know, and, and watching this this movie uh, is all in the context of some big changes uh, in our lives. You and I have lived many decades, yeah. and when we came into the world, uh, there wasn't this sense of. Um, I would let me back up. We're we're living in the United States now, and maybe in the rest of the world too, in a kind of a strange situation where you you get to pick the reality you want, where there isn't any real reality. But uh, I mean, there is. But you see, people live in constructs that are uh, variable. And my stepfather used to say. Reality, reality. Who's got the reality? You know, and it's sort of like <laughs> it's they're they're yeah. shuffling uh, shuffling cars, and it's sort of like the unknowable uh, way of knowing. And yeah. uh, especially after the torrent of disinformation to which we've been subjected during the yeah. Trump administration. Uh, oh. Has really destabilized everyone's sense of well, how do you know how do you know what to know you know how do you how do you know we know anything and it's well, very disturbing. One of the great things discoveries in in making the film was the testimony of uh, Richard Cottam, the CIA agent, who was tasked by the CIA to write fake news about Mohammed Mossadegh in Washington right. D.C. and telex it to the American embassy in Iran, and then that embassy had connections with by paying off newspapers, and that those articles, which were fake news, would appear the next day in the Iranian press to discredit and to denigrate and to cause doubt, and everything about fake news was invented and, and practiced by the CIA against Iranians in 1953 in order to soften everybody up so that when the coup actually happened it was like yeah whatever you know and that's that's the that's the that's the storybook that's that's how it's done and he took pride in that yeah he well, was he was he individually did not he he later turned against it um, and you can see that in his uh, testimony but Organizationally, yes, it it was seen as 
good stuff. This is this is how we can do it. And that coup, which is the first time the CIA had gone so massively off campus to destabilize a foreign country in a different hemisphere, was the template for all of those other 64 coups, uh, including Cuba and Chile and Guatemala and Vietnam. And Vietnam. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, I've been jumping around in my questions, so. Oh, um, late in the film, there are these traveling shots through Tehran. Yeah. Uh, where we see people on the sidewalk and shops, and it seems to be shot from a car, just driving along the streets, shooting straight out. Yeah. Uh, what, what is that? Is that period footage? Is that contemporary yeah. footage? What? Yeah. It was uh, it was another great find. Uh, it's 35 millimeter. A lot of it is 35 millimeter shot, not in 53, but shortly thereafter um, mm -hmm. for a projected feature film. And they were doing basically it was location hunting uh, on what does Tehran look like. And there it's not in our film, but in some of that you see a person walking around in a suit and that's you know, stands in for the actor who was going to be in in the film. But it's a beautiful, a very evocative material. When we, there's a shot of a little kid running along. And when Tagi sees that shot, he says, that's me, meaning <laughs> not literally him, but that's yeah. his neighborhood. And at that age, when he was seven or six, however old that kid is, that's exactly what he would do. He would run around, you know, to the various shops and hang out and, you know, his dad uh, ran a shop in the in the bazaar and he would, you know, hang out and then run around and go fetch stuff and just have a great time. Yeah, it has a very special quality, a very unusual quality. Um, and uh, it just stu it stood out for me. So um, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I haven't touched on here? Um, <laughs> I know that you're uh, very involved in the reaction to the film. Oh, the, the film was shown recently in, in Iran, I understand. Yeah, it, so. uh, it was uh, included in, at the Verite uh, Documentary Festival in December. It wasn't allowed to compete, uh, but it was shown and it, it won the audience award there. And that award, uh, got it admitted in competition to the Fajr Film Festival, which was just held a couple of weeks ago in, in Tehran. That's kind of the big, the Khan Film Festival of Iran. And it won the top prize for best documentary. And it was not censored, which we were amazed at. Tagi was amazed at, that they let the whole thing in, even though it, uh, there's just, complicity with the uh, with the mullahs uh, at the at the time of the coup some of the mullahs were involved in overthrowing Mossadegh so we we expected that to maybe get censored but it wasn't so have the mullahs weighed in on the film or no well Tagi could answer that I, I don't think so uh, it's the it's the power of your conversation that we've been going on for an hour and I thought we could go on for another hour but I've come in uh, to also uh, give you some questions that have come in. Okay. Uh, this, this is wonderful. This is exactly what I dreamt it would be, the nitty gritty and the forensic analysis of the film by two film editors. That was such a joy. And, and you'll be glad to know that I'm now much calmer. I was like a chicken on fire. <laughs> in the uh, So um, yes, the, the film was shown in Iran uh, uncut. It's been received really well. Uh, my inbox is exploding with uh, uh, emails from a lot of young people born after the revolution who are saying thank you for telling us our own history. Um, so, yeah, and uh, some I loved your questions, Paul. A lot of questions that have never been asked before. So, oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, if it's okay, there are a bunch of questions that have come in through email. Uh, and in fact, I'm glad to say there are also questions for both of you, Paul and Walter. So, that, that oh, would good. be good. So, um, let me start. That's with, extra. That's extra? <laughs> yeah. Get your people to call my people and then send an invoice. 
<laughs> um, thank you. Um, so this is a question from Maggie. Um, Ku53 is an amazing look at how important documentaries can be from showing the, showing, from the, showing the amount of time and, and work that goes into them uh, and, and it's passionate, from its passionate creators to, and to a past documentary being integral in helping to uncover the full extent of Britain's involvement in this, in this particular coup. How conscious were you while you were filming that, that this would end up being a secondary theme of the film, the tangible real world power of documentary filmmaking? And she says, by the way, you're all fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, right, well, we, I mean, Tagi can talk to that, certainly because that was one of the things that drove him to make the film. But I, I shared that right from the beginning and that never wavered. We were, we wanted to make a gripping, interesting film, but we also wanted, we, we knew that this film was going to last and that we were beholden to tell the truth. Uh, or aspects of the truth and let the audience make up their mind. But we wanted to at least present the audience with these different uh, versions. And so the, it, you know, that it wasn't oppressive, but it definitely was something that was present with us in the room as we were making the film. We, we took the job very seriously. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Hirsch and Mr. Merch from Show. I'd like to hear from each of you a story of getting stuck with a difficult creative challenge while you were editing and how you found a solution to, um, to that problem and what the solution was. This is like, out of all the movies over 50 years, 42 movies or so, pick one creative challenge and how you solved it. Right. So, Walter, take it away. No, you do it. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gee. Um, I was always uh, afraid that someone was going to ask me a question that required me to think, <laughs> and, uh, and this is one of them. Um, well, um, I worked on a film years ago that uh, was produced independently, and the producer took it around to all the studios, and no one would touch it because of a plot development uh, that they found uh, too edgy. And um, I, so the film was facing uh, being unreleased and I thought about it and I thought, how could we, we couldn't take the foot, we couldn't take the event that they found objectionable out but what could we do with it? So I came up with the idea of substituting a close-up of our star in place of a wide shot. And I substituted one shot in the film. Wow. And the film was accepted by Columbia and distributed that way. And the, the change that, that I made was, or suggested, I, uh, was there was a... Uh, an event took place, I don't want to say what it was. And uh, it was this event that people found objectionable. So the event, the scene in the movie started with an establishing shot of a house, and then the event took place in the house. Uh, we had a shot of our lead actor, Cliff Robertson, asleep from a later scene. So I took his shot of him asleep and placed it before the event and turned it into a dream sequence. So oh. it was the exact same footage, but by bracketing it with Cliff asleep, we're saying, this didn't really happen. This is just a look into his, his desires in his dreams. And the same footage yeah. in a different context had a completely different meaning. Excellent. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, that's, yeah. What I, Absolutely. that's what I thought of right now. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about editing as opposed to directing is that you can walk away from the desk. Uh, you can go take a hike. You can go uh, get a cup of coffee. You can go home. You can take a shower the next morning. I, I find that the shower will frequently unlock something that uh, is waiting to be unlocked. So. You know, you you have the ability to switch tracks, so to speak, 
if you if you don't step away from the editing table, you can you can also switch to another part of the film. Well, I can't solve that right now, but let me go to work on something in this other reel. And sometimes just the simple kind of housekeeping that you, we all have to do will allow your unconscious to uh, grapple. Uh, frequently, when we are presented with a problem, we try to attack it consciously. And that the conscious mind is a, is a kind of a yammering creature. Why well, you can do this, you can do that, right? like that won't work, you know. And that that makes the unconscious, which is much bigger and more productive, it just uh, kind of says, I'm out of here. So quiet the, the yammering, do something else, and then the unconscious will arise. But it's going to talk very quietly. You know, it will not yell at you, but it will say, no, you could do this. And frequently you're very tired. Uh, I want to go home. And it says, well, you could do this. And you say, okay, I'll do it. And then that unlocks the answer to whatever the problem is. I mean, the other thing is to listen to your collaborators, your assistants, if you're lucky enough to have an assistant, listen to your assistants because they have a different point of view about things. Uh, obviously listen to the director as well. But, uh, but frequently assistants, uh, the people who are nominally working for you uh, have a different take on things. And that, I mean, the, a vivid example of that is the problem we had in English patient. A whole scene had to be cut out because we previewed it and it just did not work. It involved a reference to the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Kip's reaction to that atomic bomb, which just in the book, it's a pivotal scene, but in the movie, it's like, what's what's this? We're not thinking about that. Um, it's and like so an atom bomb. To, yeah, it's just the atom <laughs> bomb. So we had to cut it out. But then on the other side of that cut, Kip is a completely different person. So. How do we explain the fact that he's so different? I mean, he's, he's a Sikh, but he's take his turban off. He's got long hair. He won't talk to anybody. He just sits. And uh, we were, that was one of those things. We're stuck. Uh, I couldn't figure out an answer. Anthony couldn't figure out an answer. And we sort of went in a spiral. But uh, Edie Ichioka, hello, Edie, if you're listening, uh, came up one day and said, you know, boss, that's what she called me. You know, boss, a bomb is a bomb. And then she turned and left. And I said, wait, what do you mean? And she just, a bomb is a bomb, she said. She walked off. And I thought, I get it. Because there is a booby trap bomb that kills Hardy, who is the sergeant to Kip's lieutenantness. And under tragic circumstances, the war is over, that bomb goes off and Hardy is killed. And the word comes back, Hardy has been killed. Um, and that explains why Kip is now sit, sitting Shiva, so to speak, the, the Hindu equivalent of, uh, or the Sikh equivalent of. So that solved the problem. But it, it's in, in its bones, it's kind of similar to what Paul was just saying. Uh, nothing fundamentally changes, but you change how the audience is going to take it. And that, that's one pretty clear example of that. But thank you, thank you, Edie. <laughs> when you were talking about stepping away from the film, I knew an editor, I can't remember who it is now, but he used to say he would let the, the cuts heal. He wouldn't watch yeah. it for a while. He'd, he'd let the cuts heal. Yeah, exactly. Wow. This is turning out to be a true masterclass. Uh, in the spirit of it being a masterclass, uh, I have a question from uh, Gareth, who says, Hello, Paul and Walter. Thank you very much for a very insightful event today. My th this is your chance to inspire a film, film editor of the future. My 13-year-old son, who is very interested in film editing, Wanted to ask what editing software and tools have you used over your career and what recommendation might you have for a beginner with limited resources? Also, any book recommendations or tips that may help him expand his interest 
and knowledge in this area. Yes, uh, a long, long time ago in a country room far away, <laughs> and, and blink in the eye. Right. <laughs> but uh, take the question away. Uh, well, as Paul was saying er earlier, we've kind of, uh, when we joined the film business in the 60s, the machine was the moviola and it it had been the the machine for 40 years from the mid 20s until the mid 60s and there was just there was a little changes but not much then the drum beat began and the european editing machine started to come into the united states the steenbeck and the chem flatbed editing tables and they sort of uh jousted with the moviola over the next uh, well, 20 plus years and then uh, digital editing started to make itself really felt and now there's a proliferation of different editing software. Um, so we've experienced all of them in one form or another. Uh, I'd just like to chime in that editing is not a technological process. It's a right. mental process and the tools I have found over the course of my career don't really matter all that much. They they do matter marginally, but uh, writing is not about the pen. Right. You know, it's it's a mental process, and editing is how you think about the material, and not so much which tools you use to accomplish what you're thinking. To answer the the thirteen year old question, I would just you know you you start with iMovie, which is pretty sophisticated these days, and it's free. Uh, you have to buy a Mac and, and use it, but there may be a Windows equivalent of iMovie. I'm sure I'm sure there is, but it's very user friendly, and you can start to you know you're you're paddling in the narrow in the shallow end of the pool, and you can get a little bit deeper. And once you feel comfortable at, at the at the three foot level, you can move to uh, Final Cut X uh, or Premiere. I used Premiere on to cut Ku uh, fifty three, but for, if, if you if you're starting out, they're they're a little daunting because there's so many bells and whistles, uh, and you want to keep those to a to a minimum. But I just echo what Paul said. It's it's all about uh, you know emotion, story, and rhythm. Those are the three big ones. Can you convey the right emotion? Tell a coherent story and do it in the correct uh, engaging rhythm where people are moved by, by the musicality of the rhythm itself. Uh, we're going to ask two more questions and begin to wrap up. Uh, I have another question here for you uh, from Arthur, who's a fellow ACE member. Question for Walter and Paul. I remember Werner Herzog saying that one should never let the truth get in the way of telling a good story. In making this or any documentary, how much do you think one can bend the truth, even slightly, to tell a good, compelling story? Yeah, well, uh, you know, there's the famous uh, Picassoism: art is a lie that tells the truth. It depends on your frame of reference. I mean, the the the, the guru of uh, kind of pure documentary making is Frederick Wiseman, who goes into an environment, the hospital or the court system or whatever it is, and very sparely with no bells and whistles, no fancy stuff, sh shooting film still, I think. And, uh, you know, that that's, uh, I guess, Puritan filmmaking. Uh, Coup 53 is not that. We we do use some bells and whistles, as Paul pointed out. You know, there are little uh, grace notes that are there to enhance the the moment. So those are not strictly true. Uh, they're added. Uh, they're they're mu musical grace notes. On the other hand, the the uh, the primary events in the film are true. They're as true as we can make them knowing that you know, as soon as you point a camera at something, you're not showing what's off to the left or right. Is it true? Well, yeah, it's yeah. true in as much as it's true about what you're looking at, but what's over here and what's over there? So having 
said that as as a conditional the, the the we were as i said earlier we were aware of our responsibility to to tell the truth but we didn't go at it in the frederick wiseman way of of doing it but as you point out just pointing a camera at something is editing yeah because yeah. you're just showing what's in front of the lens you know you know yeah. i'm reminded of in California, we have these wildfires and they have these helicopter shots uh, and they, you know, it's horrendous. And you see the flames filling the, the, the frame. And, and then sometimes the cameraman will zoom out and you'll see a big wide shot and you'll see that the fire is just in a little part of a mountain range. Yeah. And you say, well, wait a second. I, I had the impression the whole world was on fire. <laughs> and then you, yeah. you see that is, you know, so, uh, just as you said, Walter, pointing a camera at somebody is an act of editing. Yeah. So it's not reality. And on the other hand, reality, reality, who's got the reality? You know, everyone, <laughs> everyone yeah. now is living, looking at their phones. Uh, this conversation is being held on the screens, you know, so is this reality? Uh, it is in a sense, but, you know, I, yeah. it's an unanswerable question. Uh, there is uh, one last question here, and I swear it's not a plant. So uh, I, I'm going to ask Paul to read this question, um, and, and then we'll do a wrap up. It's it's, it's okay. in the box. It's in the box. Yes, I see. I see it. It's from May May Chang. May Chang has asked this question. Uh, I don't think I have the whole question. It's it's the last one in the chat box, the private chat box to the right. Um, what does it begin with? Ku-53 uh, needs to be seen on a massive scale by people in the U.S. where the hegemony of mainstream media is a common obstacle to untainted information and a blockade to people's access to truth. But we know that mainstream film awards are capable of giving films a bump in viewership. Do you think there are enough voting members in the Academy to do justice to this film? Or do you already know that the industry will again choose to turn a blind eye to the importance of this film? Uh, uh, Walter, shall I, do you want to go, shall I? I? Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, Tagi has talked about this briefly at the beginning. The, the film, this film was not financed uh, by any studio. A studio came in, but then pulled out. We were turned down by 22 festivals. Uh, all of the big ones, Cannes, Venice, uh, Berlin, Hot Docs, uh, Toronto, et cetera, and turned down kind of like, nah, nah. <laughs> uh, and then, thankfully, Telluride said yes. Uh, and actually, the same day, we got an OK from the London Film Festival. So that was like, what happened? The, the world just opened up. And so we showed it at festivals. and. A big distributor, uh, a Telluride, came over to Paul Zantz, our producer, and said, fantastic film. We want to distribute it. Let's talk as soon as I get back to New York. And then silence. And so we were ghosted. And that happened a lot. Uh, interest and then nothing. And uh, so we finally, thanks to, in a sense, to the crisis of COVID, the idea of using video on demand uh, linked to theaters presented itself as a viable option. And that's how we got this film out there. But it doesn't have a studio behind it. It doesn't have a sales agent behind it. Uh, it's got none of the, the, the vested interests behind it. Um, it's just a lone film. Uh, and those tend to be ignored because, yeah, if I vote for it, but you know, what's what's in it for me, sort of speak. Well, what's in it for you is a film that is well-made, I will say, uh, and that tells the truth of something that needs to be known in an interesting and provocative way. But it, it's of a piece with everything. So we, we failed to get in to the, uh, to BAFTA as a doc best documentary. We, we didn't make the short list uh, on BAFTA, and we didn't make the shortlist at the Academy. We're still alive at 
organizations like ACE, uh, thank you, ACE, and uh, we're still alive in the the big open categories at the at the Oscars. You know, that's that's a uh, a long, long, long shot, but you know, it it's uh, providing us the sort of the emotional fuel to do these sort of events. So yeah, we're we're still hanging in there. Um, to wrap up, uh, I had a whole bunch of beautifully eloquent sentences that I was going to use in my introduction. I'm now going to use them now. And they're going to shamelessly refer to Apocalypse Now and Star Wars. Every independent film is its own unique miracle. And this film, the fact that this film is even made, is a miracle. Uh, from day one, the gods of cinema gave me Walter Murch. Uh, the industry shunned the film, but we persevered. We made it. The film goes into the heart of darkness of Britain's colonial past and its crimes. And right throughout, the force has been with it. We are the rebels in the empire fighting the empire. And the film is still here. It's still connecting with audiences. And as Walter said, the film is still in the main categories. Uh, uh, I'm not deluded enough to think that Coup 53, a little political documentary that's ruffling feathers, is going to win, win Best Picture against all the studio films. But I can put, put my hand on my heart and say, Walter's editing is genius piece of filmmaking. His editing in this film stands head and shoulders. It's been, if this film never wins an award, I personally have won the best award in cinema by simply working with Walter Merch for four years in the cutting room. And now the icing on the cake, we get to speak about the film with Paul Hirsch and Walter Merch. Uh, uh, you're this very film, gracious. Amen. You're welcome, and, and, and I'm honored that you, you took part. I'm honored that you accepted to be here and talk about the film in such great forensic detail. Uh, awards will come and go, no question. Crew 53 will stay long after we've gone and we'll collect, co connect with audiences. Right, People right across South America are dying to see this film. Every country that's been screwed by America and CIA is desperate to see this film. The entire Indian subcontinent can't wait because they've had the empire. They've had the empire. So they know what this film is about. So um, please watch the film. Connecting with audiences is important. Uh, uh, and uh, there will be um, uh, a slide at the end with, with social media things to follow. Uh, it's, on, it's still on virtual theaters. I forgot to say we were, we were not really plugging books, but uh, I know Walter is writing a new one, so you're in for a treat. And I've been privileged to read some of the chapters. It's going to be mind blowing. Stand by for, for Walter's new book coming out next year. Uh, I won't say more because it's amazing. And uh, and just a final uh, thank you to Aggie Merch, Walter's wonderful, wonderful uh, English wife. It's Aggie who actually brought us together. Walter working on this film was Aggie's idea. Uh, this is right. this is a family. This is a family affair because Beatrice Merch, behind the scenes in Utrecht, it's now way past her bedtime at 1:30 in the morning is driving this live stream. So this is how connected this is. This is an amazingly intimate family affair. This entire film is self-distributed with five people at their kitchen tables with no studio behind it. That's a testimony to the power of independent filmmaking. So um, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for gracing us with your presence. Brilliant questions. Uh, I, My pleasure. I, I, if it wasn't late, we could talk for another two hours. But, um, but we have to send people home. We have to go to bed. Um, Watch the movie, tell people about it, follow social media. And, uh, and if you are an Ampas member, watch the film. We don't want you to vote for it, watch it, because we know when you watch it, you like it.